Hello, everyone, and welcome. We'll be starting in just a moment. A few, uh, few late arrivals or just on time arrivals to admit. Good afternoon, everyone, and happy Europe Day. Thank you very much for taking what is a very sunny Sunday, uh, a bit of time with us. And uh, I'm uh, going to remind you first that we are in a recorded session. So, uh, so the, the video that you're watching is being streamed online. It's also being recorded. Uh, so please bear that in mind. If you don't want to be recorded or have your image recorded, please turn your camera off. Uh, also, it's an open session. There's going to be quite a few people with us. And so please keep your microphone muted at all times. Um, we do, however, want to hear your contributions and to, and to get some questions. So we'll be gathering questions using the Zoom chat right the way through the session. Uh, so a couple, couple of things there for those who are just arriving. Uh, session is being recorded and ask questions in the Zoom chat. We'll be gathering them up and uh, asking the speakers some questions later on. Um, but uh, let me first uh, say what the session is about overall. We are uh, talking about how are public libraries and their communities solving the big challenges in Europe. And this is something that's really close to my heart, not just as someone who's a regular user of libraries, not just as someone who is a great supporter of European action and European activity, but it's also part of uh, a joining up of the local communities that libraries serve and the bigger European conversations. And it's also part of a new programme called the Europe Challenge, an initiative by the European Cultural Foundation, along with Amsterdam Public Libraries, Public Libraries 2030 and Democratic Society. So the Europe Challenge is, is involving citizens directly, helping them to imagine solutions for local challenges that affect their public space. So it's solving a European challenge in the local communities by answering very local, very personal questions. It's part of Europe's, uh, the European Cultural Foundation celebration of Europe Day today, the 9th of May. There's obviously lots of other events that you can that you can see online on the Europe Day website. But it's also something of an experiment. We're piloting, we're testing. You know, we're just starting out on this journey together. And so we, you'll be hearing from uh, from libraries today. You'll be hearing from other speakers who are going to be talking about some of the some of the challenges around it, some of the issues, some of the questions. It's a it's a really you know, important moment, but it's also only the start. So, so we are not here to tell you all of the great things we've done. We're uh, here to tell you about the fantastic things that we are trying to do, and hopefully you'll want to, to join in that challenge and, and help, us, uh, help us to solve those problems together. So uh, ECF is to take part in this conversation, not just today, but right the way through the period of the, of the challenge. And uh, so we do look forward to hearing your views. And, and today, or later, please do get involved. As I say, during the during the se uh, session, if you have any questions for our speakers, if you have any comments or thoughts, please do put them in the Zoom chat and we'll be gathering them up as we go along. Um, but uh, first I want to uh, play a short video, which will give a little bit more background to the uh, to the challenge. And then I'll, uh, then straight after that, Andre Wilkins, who uh, is the chief executive of the European Cultural Foundation, will be talking to us a little bit about, a little bit more about the challenge helping us understand what it is, why it matters, and why today, Europe Day, is the perfect day to launch it. So, uh, Ashley, if you can queue up the video, please. How do different local communities around Europe 
contribute to a shared European public space. And anyway, what should our public spaces look like in these times? How can we develop more cultural solidarity with and between citizens, regions and nationalities? How can the shared work on big and small solutions foster a sense of Europeanness? We propose to go to places which already exist everywhere and attract millions of people every day. Places which provide a home to both small stories and big history. Places of community and creation. We want to go to these places to listen, to understand the challenges of today and to develop solutions for tomorrow. These places are the libraries of Europe. There are 65,000 public libraries across Europe, both big and small, capital-based, and rural. These libraries serve as physical and online centres where people with all kinds of backgrounds have access to knowledge, experience and participation. We present the Europe Challenge with Libraries. Local questions are often shared questions in a European context. With the 2021 Europe Challenge, we build towards shared solutions to some of the most pressing challenges we face, such as inclusion and equal rights, digital literacy, reinvention of our public space, public health, environment, and post-COVID recovery. The 2021 Europe Challenge gives methodological support, funding, and space to the staff and the communities of the participating libraries to make solution-based experimentation in local and translocal settings, resulting in a great variety of people-led solutions, making a better living space and cultural solidarity for Europeans to help great ideas turn into reality, stunning proposals for solutions for Europe will receive the Europe Challenge Future Fund in the beginning of 2022. Want to get to know us or support this initiative? Write to us at ask at culturalfoundation.eu. Hi, um, thank you. Thank you, Anthony, for introducing and thanks to the makers of this um, promotional trailer. Um, we're living in, in interesting times for most of us. These are the most interesting times we've lived together in, as a community. And I say that as someone who witnessed the fall of the Berlin Wall firsthand in 1989 from the East uh, Berlin side. I thought the fall of the Berlin Wall would not top anything else in my life, but now I'm not so sure anymore. One thing seems clear after this uh, one and a half year, um, we will continue to live in, in challenging times. And that is why we're launching the Europe Challenge today on 9th May, Europe Day, 2021. So you heard from, from Anthony, you saw the trailer, and you will hear more voices in the course of the, of the next hour. Let me tell you why I am so excited about this Europe challenge, what are my expectations, and why I consider this still to be an adventure. First, one of the biggest challenges for me in, in my daily job is actually 
not only the ones which were already mentioned in, in the video, but also before, but actually it is how to reach people beyond one's own bubble. And this applies particular also to European initiatives, which are often, um, which often remain in a, in a very tight circle in a perpetuo mobile of, uh, of an ever closer European circle. But the challenges of today are just simply too big to be left to a European few to solve. We need to think bigger and we need to think beyond the, the Europe bubble. And this is for me the core of, of our uh, Europe challenge. We are trying to reach out to people who have not reached before and we are making an offer. We're making an offer to work together on challenges, on challenges which concern all of us. We try to make an offer, which hopefully is hard to refuse. Second, where do you find these people? Where do you find many people? Some would say through social networks, social media, of course. Sure, um, but does that only mean digital social networks? I would say no. And that's why we want to go to places, uh, as it said in the video, places which already exist everywhere in Europe, places which attract millions of people every day anyway already, to places with history, knowledge, but also where future come together with these things. We believe these places um, are the libraries of Europe. Third, you saw in the, library, in the trailer, so it must be true, um, there are 65,000 public libraries in Europe, almost every town, every rural district has one or more. There are century old ones like in Lisbon, there are shiny new ones um, like in, in Aarhus. There are under-resourced ones, there are mobile ones, there are prestigious university libraries and there are small community libraries. Libraries I also discovered in the last um, few years uh, working with them more than just only as a library user are part of a social cultural fabric of Europe. And I feel smartly connected, um, the libraries can actually be considered and are a truly social network of Europe, analog and digital. Fourth point um, I want to make Europe is not just Brussels. Brussels, of course, belongs to Europe, is a very important and, and beautiful city, but Europe is not just Brussels. Local challenges are often shared challenges within a European context. With the Europe challenge, we want to identify these shared local challenges, and we want to support shared European solutions. We want to connect the local with the European experience, we want to make it one experience uh, through the local connection, having a European experience. Working with the public libraries across Europe, we aim to provide a local open and free access to the Europe challenge via a trusted, safe and public space that is serving people with very different needs and backgrounds. Fifth point I want to make is the Europe challenge is not just a single event, you know, a big gala you know, and, and, and ceremony. It is a, a collaborative process with the libraries across Europe. And of course, with their communities. I know from experience, and you all know that, that um, collaborative processes um, are not easy. They're often difficult. And possibly um, it will take more time than if you just do uh, one big bang. But we hope that in the end, we will have much bigger impact in this uh, collaborative way, which may also take a bit more time. Because in this process, or because this process of collaboration is as important to us as the eventual solution or the, the challenge prize or, uh, or an event. Six um, point, the Europe challenge itself is a challenge, at least uh, for us. To be honest, not all is clearly defined yet. 
Um, am I allowed to say that? Um, there are open questions of how this will all work out in practice. But now is the time to start this journey. We will start now, we will test, we will improve, we will test again, we will improve again, and we will scale this challenge to its full potential. This is exciting stuff, but it's also a little bit uh, scary if you, if you don't know um, the journey laid out already in full. But that is how it is with all uh, good adventures. Finally, um, seventh point, I want to make challenges and adventures in that sense are best shared with good partners and friends. We at the European Cultural Foundation, we feel fortunate that we have good partners who will start this journey together with us. These are the seven initial libraries from Amsterdam in the Netherlands, from Valmiera in Latvia, from Krai in Slovenia, from Ghent in Belgium, from Berlin in Germany, from Aarhus in Denmark, and from Barcelona in Spain. And then we have the public libraries 2030 network and the democratic society. So a, a good bunch of partners and friends. Um, and I wish to thank them already now because a, a lot of work has gone into it. Um, and I want to thank them also for getting onto this ride together with us. I think it will be worth it and I'm looking forward to it. So with this, um, thank you and handing back um, to Anthony. Thank you very much, André. And uh, that's a really great introduction to the program and also a great way to kick off our conversation today. Uh, so to take us a little bit deeper into some of the uh, issues of libraries as cultural spaces and as problem solving spaces, uh, I'm going to introduce Jan Rock, who's the assistant professor or assistant professor at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, and the question I'd ask you, Jan, is um, you know, we've heard uh, how libraries matter, but how have libraries remained and fulfilled their role at public spaces over time? Well, thank you, Anthony, for this introduction and thanks to the ECF for inviting me. Uh, I will try to answer this question indeed by turning to uh, the past. Um, I turn to the past, I turn to history because public libraries, of course, have a track record of almost two centuries of being spacious spaces with a uh, crucial role in connecting communities and individuals through books and the printing press with uh, society as a whole. And I want to go back to the very beginnings. I want to go back to the invention of the coffee house in the 17th century. According to Jürgen Habermas and many historians after him, uh, uh, coffee houses and also city theaters were the places where the modern public sphere became more than just a concept or an ideal, where it was indeed turned into a practical reality. Imagine a reading table with members of the emerging middle class uh, who started to read newspapers there and started to discuss the organization and the meaning of a democratic society. Of course, this is just a simplified image. Uh, what actually happened, happened were myriads of complex local developments in many different ways across various regions and countries of Europe and the rest of the world. Uh, and indeed in the 18th and 19th centuries, various organized forms of sociability took uh, reading and discussing uh, society and, and knowledge, uh, reading and discussing in fact the printed word to a crucially uh, wider scale. Now I'm referring now to uh, the many bourgeois debating clubs, to literary circles, philanthropic societies, uh, where middle-class citizens gathered and discussed knowledge, just like in the coffee shops. Uh, they discussed literature, they discussed culture, they discussed society. And indeed, they often also built a collection of books and periodicals and they made it accessible for, in the first instance, their members. And by doing so, they followed the earlier example of aristocratic book collections and Wunderkammers uh, or monastic collections, and indeed the few instances of local or public uh, town libraries, and also learned society. Throughout the 19th century, these bourgeois societies opened up their reading rooms 
and their connections to the public in general, also making the circulation of the circulation of books possible. And I'm thinking now of local initiatives, of course, in each and every town and every province, but also uh, I'm thinking of net networked initiatives such as the Maatschappij tot Nut van het Algemeen in Amsterdam or, or the Willemsfonds in Ghent and other towns uh, across Flanders and Belgium. But also the Grundtvig Foundation in Denmark or the different Matice in, uh, in Slovenia and, and many other countries. Now, all these societies, of course, have interesting histories, histories of their own. But let me offer you now just a schematic rendering of some dominant ideals all these libraries had in common. So this is a twofold answer, you could say, to the question, why did libraries matter in the past? On the one hand, and this etching in the background from 1718 can help to visualize what I would try to say. On the one hand, we had old humanistic ideals of rationality, standardization, and empiricism. And these ideals became a reality. They were put into practice, of course, by the use of the printing press and the spread of print capitalism, by the practice of uh, modern natural sciences, empirical sciences with these instruments, and resulting in a rational sound knowledge ordered, ordered, ordered sorry, in books and periodicals, and thus serving the powers that be, the reigning powers, in this case, Europe herself, here with the symbols of power and wealth in both hands. And this stands here in short for the ideal, of course, of enlightenment placed within a library. On the other hand, a more romantic ideal of conserving the past, of recreating the past, visualized here in, a, in, a, in, a, in an aquatint from uh, 1813. And this ideal occurred, occurred mainly after the revolutionary era and the Napoleonic Wars. The conservation and cultivation of culture, language, um, uh, popular culture, literature, art, religion, it was turned into nation building, of course, and even political resistance against imperial rule. But in any case, a cultural emancipation of the nation based on its history. Now, what did both ideals actually mean for an individual visiting a library and taking part in society? Why did libraries function as spaces for public benefit? On the one hand, this meant that libraries aimed at some kind of ideal of universal literacy and education, uh, trying to propagate it as well. And it did so also by disciplining each, mem each member of society. Since for if individual progress had to become universal progress, enlightenment universalism, universalism had to be morally loaded. And this is why libraries also were involved in uh, giving grants for study abroad, but also uh, used fines to regulate ways of conduct of each individual. And this is also why, for example, in Ireland, some reading rooms grew out of the temperance movement. On the other hand, this ideal meant not just universalism, but nationally, linguistically, religiously, etc., defined cultures. And an individual involvement meant the salvation of culture itself. The romantic discourse of loss of heritage, endangered heritage, this discourse put a cultural impetus on the individual member of the nation, salvage the national past. For example, by keeping historical collections in libraries, but also by simply reading this new phenomenon of the novel, preferably a historical novel in the national language. And this is, of course, why the British Museum is not only a mu museum, but also held a library, which is now the British Library. And thus, public libraries became a massively successful emanation of both ideals both the ideal to conserve the past of the nation and the ideal of a cultural and political emancipation of people. Both ideals resulted in a true societal innovation in the past, defining modernity, you could say. And I'm referring now to the, to the construction of a very specific communicative community, a communicative community which was morally loaded, 
which was in the first place nationally defined and imagined. And all this happened through disciplining, through disciplining access to a humanist universal culture put in vernacular languages. Both ideals of the public library are still among us and they are still present in discussions about society and culture. But in fact, both ideals very much had at their core a, an image of bourgeois readership. They were aimed at and designed by what uh, Marshall McLuhan called typographic man. Typographic man, meaning the emancipated citizen who cultivated his individual taste, who had the skill of taking part and co-constructing this shared cultural framework, who expressed in this nationally demarcated framework his own culture, his own community, and at least to some extent tending towards historicism and even conservatism. And that's why I have to ask the libraries here a final question. If both ideals of the library are intrinsically linked to this bourgeois readership and typographic man, then how can they still be useful? useful? Can they still be suitable for our times? And I think that some answers may come from critical studies in feminism and post-colonialism, for it are exactly these studies that have challenged this image of the modern citizen, this image of typographic man and his access to libraries, to, to libraries, to books, to rational knowledge, to the national parks. So the challenges of both feminism, post-colonialism and other critical studies involved every aspect I've discussed here in, uh, in this very brief historical overview. And I want to return them now to the Europe challenge with libraries in the form of a series of questions. Is the print shop and the printed word still dominant or do we live in a mixed media reality? What do other media do? What is a human and his technology? But on the other hand, books are still present. Books are still making information and intellectual engagement tactile. What kind of forms of knowledge do we need? Do we, do we need circulation of knowledge? knowledge? Do, we, do, we print, do we need printed knowledge? Which image of Europe do we need? Do we need this, this Europa Rechnans? And which heritage do we need? What did we lose, lose from the past? And what did we ignore from our past? What is excluded from the dominant accounts of European and national histories? And also, who is this library visitor? How did he get here? And where is his community? Or is this simply typographic man? Access to the public space is not equal, is still not equal. Really women, for example, were considered for centuries as dangerous and uncontrollable. Uh, and I'm not mentioning problems, of course, of illiteracy. So how can we go to conclude beyond dominant national heritages and identities, how can we offer new spaces to alternative histories and stories and fresh access to libraries for new communities? How, in short, as my final sentence, how, in short, can public libraries do once more better than coffee shops and their expensive lattes? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. That was fascinating. And uh, I'm sure you all have questions and thoughts that you'd want to share. Please do so in the Zoom chat and we'll gather up some thoughts for later on. Um, but while you're doing that, and while you're thinking of it, I have a, a few questions to some of the libraries who are our, our guests here today. Um, so the first one is for uh, uh, Martin Lammers from Amsterdam Public Libraries and Asmund Bertelsen from Aldous. Um, and that question is, how can libraries once again reshape the relation between individual and society through culture and community? How could they innovate the public sphere in the modern age? Uh, and is that relevant today? So, Martin. Well, thank you, uh, Anthony. And thank you, Jan, for this uh, eloquent uh, um, talk about uh, the history of libraries. Um, I, I'd like to, to add one, uh, for me, important uh, issue to it. 
uh, because uh, libraries were much about uh, conserving and about uh, uh, the history. And I think nowadays libraries are about the future. Uh, it's still about sharing. So uh, in, that, in that sense, there's nothing new. Uh, but the new thing is that, um, as Jan already uh, stated, uh, we worked in we work uh, with uh, a mix of uh, a lot of uh, different methods and different tools that are all about sharing information and creating information and maybe this issue of creating information and creating knowledge together um, and making um, uh, a new uh, way of living together which is defined by uh, uh, lifelong learning is uh, specifically what makes libraries unique in our um, society. There are no other public spaces that are really safe spaces accessible for any citizen that would uh, like to access um, the space, whether it be physical or digital. Um, and libraries, have the possibility, but also the urgency uh, to, uh, to create this safe environment in which people can share, in, in which people can develop, uh, and in which people can create new ways of uh, living together by um, understanding what other people think, what other people do, uh, and by uh, creating in this way, a, a, way of understanding each other and i think there's no other public institution with this free access um, um, so it's a giant opportunity to help local communities help city communities rural communities but also help um, europe develop to a new society in which uh, information and knowledge is shared in a um, uh, in a fair way and in a way that uh, we all can uh, work on information and knowledge that is reliable. So to Amsterdam, to us, uh, for the public library in Amsterdam, it's, it's a, a wonderful opportunity to work together in this uh, challenge because um, we have to do it now. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, uh, Asmund from Orvis, uh, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, I'd be interested in your take, particularly on some of the challenges of, of modernity and of, and of modernization, uh, but also that connection between closer together. How do yeah. Um, to start with, I would say that, yes, it is more relevant now maybe than ever before um, because the libraries are in the essence for everybody in, a, in our society and with with that comes and from both experts, citizens, and so on, so that a, a lot of the initiatives is placed at the citizens' hands. Um, so we get new ideas and new takes on how to create community in that way, but also we try to make sure that it is relevant and that for everybody, and that equal access actually means equal access, and that we are not those in the in a tower trying to in a high tower trade trying to create, create community for all the others, but inviting in and saying here is the place for you to create community and are in the community learn new, uh, uh, learn new skills, gain gain knowledge and so on. All the core uh, abilities of libraries. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and on that, that question about you know, access and thinking about how to bring people in. I wanted to ask Brussels again. 
Now, Ghent is a, you know, it's an amazing city, it's vibrant, there's an enormous amount going on, but obviously it's also a really complex place. What does your library uh, offer to the citizens of your town, uh, the citizens of your city, and how are you setting up community working uh, in Thank you, Anthony, for uh, saying all those nice, thing, nice things about Ghent. They're very true. Um, what we're doing uh, in the Krok in Ghent um, uh, for the Europe Challenge is setting up a program, uh, a program of activities towards citizens um, that starts from a few different premises. Um, the first one is that we not only as a library want to give information to the people, but also ask information from them. Specifically, we want to ask them what are the challenges that we should focus on. Um, for example, this year we're working around the future of health, um, but instead of choosing a topic, we're asking them what are challenges that are relevant to you? Is it air pollution? Is it, is it something about mental well-being, something about nutrition? And what are specifically the challenges that are important to you? Um, so that's what the, the first uh, thing that's important to us there. The second thing is that we want um, people who are interested to, uh, to join in this challenge, to work with us in a process of brainstorming and design thinking um, towards a solution for a challenge. We want them to be able to join in on this process um, at any point um, and, and to do that uh, by, with the level of commitment that they feel up to. Um, this way we want to, we want to uh, make sure that uh, the process is very accessible to everybody and not only to people who um, are already very confident about, okay, I want to, to, uh, to, to start on this process from point A and take it to point Z, um, but we want to, them to be involved in as much of the activ activities as they want to. Do they want to be in the core group? Uh, taking it throughout all the whole process, that's fine. Do they want to just join in one of the brainstorm activities? That's fine as well. Um, we also believe that that way the community becomes an evolving thing and that a lot of new people meet people from different backgrounds and a lot of different uh, new collaborations can be set up. And uh, the third premises is that we really want to try and make it fun uh, and welcome as much people as we can that way uh, to participate in the challenge. Right now, the, the, the options are limited as they are everywhere uh, in the world, I think. But if we, uh, if we can do brainstorms later on this year in little boats floating through the city of Ghent, which is, as you said, very lovely, uh, then it would be fantastic to us. Um, so we really hope that becomes possible again. Fantastic, thank you very much indeed. Um, and uh, you know, picking up on that question about you know, what the challenge uh, what the challenge looks like in different places, uh, somewhere that is uh, very different is Barcelona. So I'm going to ask Andreu Orte from Barcelona Public Libraries to talk a bit about the topic of the challenge as it's seen from there. Uh, what does it look like in Barcelona? Who's going to be working on, uh, on a solution for it there? Thank you, Anthony. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andre Ort and I work for the Barcelona Province uh, Libraries Network. Today I'm representing the project of the Jordi Rubio y Balaguer's Library in San Boy de Llobregat. The project, the project is being mostly led by the director of the library, Maria Montia, who is uh, not, not available to, to attend this meeting today. Um, San Boy is a city 17 kilometers away from the city of Barcelona, so it's quite close to the main the capital of, of Catalonia. Currently, 85,000 people live there. It's a city with a powerful industrial sector and services, but it also has a strong integration of agriculture and the river landscape. So once I introduce myself and the local con context with, I think it's quite uh, important, I'm introducing the big idea of, of San Boy's project. The project aims to connect bees and libraries in a community-oriented project. It's quite counterintuitive, right? Uh, bees, libraries, what? Well, mixing well. We think that they can they can fit well in one project. Some boys library is focusing on beekeeping as a theme to address various city challenges, such as public space projects have the link between urban and natural environment. There are probably some other. Uh, um, Priorities, but this is the, these are the three main priorities. More specifically, there are active architectural trends that are inspired by non-humans forms of, of, of living spaces. So beekeeping can be a useful tool to think about redefining public space and people's relationships in the town. Uh, beekeeping can be also a powerful theme 
to address the coexistence of people with animals and plants and the importance of uh, urban nature to improve human health in the municipality, but it can be also used in other towns in similar environment. Uh, the project is being de developed together with uh, municipal departments, such as participation, uh, culture, environment, and education. And it, we are following also a co-design methodology and orientation by the Citizen Lab of San Boy de Llobregat, Coboy Lab. So in the short term, uh, the installation of beehives and other collaborative uh, actions are planned. And uh, we're developing a model of the project will, uh, that will be, is it the place, is the library a place to be? Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. Now, one of the things that really strikes me about the scale of this challenge and also the uh, imagination that's needed is the variety of places that we're talking about and the variety and complexity of Europe. So we've heard about uh, the situation in cities, in urban areas. But it's also important to think about the ways in which libraries support smaller cities and the communities around them. So, uh, so on that you know, on that basis, we're going to go completely to the other side of Europe, to Latvia. I'm going to ask Svetlana Yodor from Valmiera Library. Um, what are the important issues that are playing out in Latvia? You know, what does it look like in your region? How does your situation affect your work and your engagement of communities? What's similar and what's different from what we've heard already? Well, yes, uh, thank you. And currently here in Latvia, we are experiencing uh, administrative territorial reform. And that means that uh, several small, uh, small uh, municipalities will be merged into one larger region. And that also means that usual structure of self-government and uh, the way how local de level decisions are made will also change. And at this moment of transition to uh, questions that are important to our local communities, um, uh, whether interests of all local communities will be heard and um, whether uh, the communities that uh, live uh, further away from new development center uh, still have equal uh, chance to turn uh, decisions into their favor and uh, reach decision makers. And whether after losing their local administration uh, and becoming a part of a bigger municipality, uh, whether their culture and historical identity uh, will still be uh, the same value. And um, knowing that, we have asked our local community uh, how these changes will affect uh, community engagement. And, uh, we uh, wanted to understand uh, what forms of participation they need most now. Uh, so that uh, they would feel equal and understood their value in shaping the new local region. And uh, we, uh, we speak with our local uh, people and the answers we heard is that local community need a common space for communication and interaction. And this defines our Europe challenge for Valmier Library. Uh, we will highlight uh, the importance uh, of people participation in shaping public space and uh, democracy. And we will update the library as a platform for dialogue uh, and we'll bring people together so they can share their knowledge and their stories. Uh, Thank you very much, Svetlana. Uh, and uh, we've started to think about what the Europe challenge might look like in different places. So I'm going to I'm going to ask a little bit in a little bit more detail a couple of other libraries to talk about their work. Um, so first, Tim Lake from the Central and Regional Library in Berlin. What does the Europe challenge mean to you? How do you see it helping to build an open, diverse, and democratic Europe from from your perspective in Berlin? Thanks a lot for this question, Anthony. Um, so as a public library in Berlin, we want to react on current societal challenges, which we are facing in the local, but also in an international context. 
And with the Europe Challenge Project, we focus on political developments like the increasing impact that populistic movements have in our days, and also the ongoing political disruption. And having those alarming developments in mind, we want to design our library as a platform for the urban society, which means that the communities are invited to use our library as a space to express their interests, as well as to create and share knowledge. And with the Europe Challenge Project, we, in, we especially invite the queer, the LGBTIQ community to use our library as their platform. And, and why did we choose the queer community? Well, like I just mentioned, we are facing a political situation of increasing undemocratic movements. And each societal group is affected very differently by this political climate. And in this climate, we think the queer community, they need to raise its voice to be better represented in political debates as well as in the public space. So for us, the European challenge gives the opportunity to hand the library's keys over to the community. So that in best case, the community is the host and we are just guests in our own library. And the approach of the European challenge to proceed as an international network of libraries is a huge opportunity for us in Berlin, I can say. Thank you, Tim, that's, uh, that's great. And I'm gonna ask uh, the same question to Nina Svetel from Crown's uh, City Library. Uh, what does the Europe challenge look like from your perspective? short technical pause there. Thank you. Thank you for bearing okay. with us, Nina. <laughs> Hello. Um, yes, uh, in Crown City Library, uh, we will, uh, we chose the topic of engagement of women in technology. Uh, we want to break down uh, stereotypes, uh, reveal, uh, reveal new possibilities and encourage women to participate in technology. Uh, the challenge will be uh, to promote equal opportunities for all um, with the different activities connected to our theme. Uh, we will upgrade, upgrade our public space uh, as a place that vocalizes uh, critical thinking and deals with stereotypes. Um, at the same time, we would like to uh, raise awareness uh, for, of, um, in all generations, because we as a library, we can uh, access um, the general public, so we can uh, address parents, students, employees, as well as, well as retired people. Um, and we will prepare activities uh, in such a way that one part will be uh, intended for the general public, and the other for the small circle of women who will be enabled to acquire certain skills that according to many prejudices uh, are not in the domain of women. Um, based on the findings of our local um, uh, group of representatives, uh, we, uh, plan we are planning different um, uh, activities such as a living library with books uh, who will uh, who will be um, uh, successful women in the in stereotypical uh, male professions uh, uh, robotics for workshops for for girls uh, programming learning for um, um, women and uh, this is uh, i think especially important a literary com competition which to to short stories uh, titled Technophobia is not for women. So the program will the program will address uh, the widest uh, circle of the uh, of the public and at the same time offer specific knowledge to the narrow groups uh, through a literary competition. Uh, then we will encourage um, thinking about the technophobia and women in our society. So that is how we want to build an open and democratic and diverse European Union, <laughs> European, European place. Thank you very much, Nina. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, to say a few words about the Europe challenge itself and particularly what's going to happen. So you've heard from every corner of, of Europe. You've heard from Denmark, from Slovenia, from Spain uh, and from Latvia about the challenges in their areas. 
and what uh, what things look like on the ground. And so the first part of the Europe challenge is identifying those local challenges, working with people, working with communities, libraries as a centre of those community conversations supported by some of the specialist facilitation skills from Democratic Society, my own organisation and the other partners. Um, and from those relevant challenges, we'll be experimenting and incubating solutions using some seed funding generously provided by the European Cultural Foundation and the most exciting solutions that are replicable, the relevant and scalable on the European level will be selected by an independent jury to, to receive money from the Europe Challenge Future Fund Awards. Now, this is a, this is a great way, in my, uh, you know, in my opinion, um, to, to take those local, uh, local initiatives, the things at small scale, the things that are the, the, the local problems, but also identify the shared questions and the shared solutions and scale them up to local level. So people who are working with their libraries, working with a place they, they probably walk past every day and, and which they could direct, direct a tourist to in two minutes, they suddenly see that conversation connected with a whole European challenge, with a whole European question. And I think that is, if that's, uh, that for me is an absolute summary of the, the great positive uh, benefit of this challenge, but also the possibilities that are emerging to reconnect European conversations at local level and European level through a combination of community activism, new technology and new approaches at the European scale. Um, so I want to pick up a couple of questions. Um, the first is, uh, it's actually for, for Andre. Um, now, yeah, I run a, an NGO, we're part of all sorts of networks, uh, they're great places to kind of meet people, they're great places to kind of chat and, and you know, in normal times, you know, go to events and, and catch up with old friends. But these networks aren't always the most uh, action focused things in the world, sometimes they're more uh, just you know, spaces for people to, co to talk and chat. What does, uh, what does the Europe Challenge uh, network uh, do that's different and how is it going to be different from the existing networks for libraries that are out there? Good question. And um, I don't know um, all the answers to it, but for us, this is, um, is an experiment because we, we, we do many of these things you mentioned. We work with NGO networks. Um, we work with um, one of the things we're discussing in a minute. It's part of the um, Europe Day is we work with art institutions on a European pavilion. We work through people to people exchange. We're, we're working on all sorts of different level and our approach is how can we create a European sense of belonging, a European sentiment. Um, and it, it's, um, you know, it's, we have worked in the past with universities as part of, um, you know, having co-created the Erasmus program. That was a, was a, was a good thing. And we are now trying um, to see um, whether this connection, everyone um, talked about the connection between the local and European can be established through this um, working together with the libraries and, and, and the European Cultural Foundation and the Democratic Society and other organizations. So we see this as a start, as a test run, and um, we have big expectations. Um, uh, my colleagues, uh, when um, when um, I'm saying let, let's think big, I always say, you know, what's our next Erasmus? Um, so I, I, I see that as uh, the potential next Erasmus in a way that you can really achieve something on a European scale um, by tapping into an existing um, infrastructure. And, and we have this existing infrastructure in Europe, the libraries, um, they have gone through a, a big reform process, I think over the last 50, maybe longer years as part of uh, digitalization. Um, in many ways, I, I, from what I have seen, they have come, um, they are a step ahead than, than others in many ways. I mean, because um, libraries are places where you can get a book, but there are so much more. Um, and, and people don't uh, see that uh, yet, but um, I have seen it. Um, I'm, I'm excited about what, what's, um, what's on offer in working with the libraries. And I, I think um, this can really be a game changer. Um, that's big expectations. Um, now we have to see how that will work out in practice. Um, but um, even um, this discussion today here, and I know all the 
work which went into it in preparation um, that makes me very hopeful that it is not just another kind of, of civil society network which is a good thing but um, often manages doesn't manage to to um, have the scale it could have so i expect um, um, a lot of good thinking a lot of um, very practical doing and then in in the end um, scaling because the seven libraries and partners are only a beginning um, now, how can we do that from from seven to sixty five thousand? I mean, that is uh, that is the question I have, and um, I don't have the answer, but maybe someone has. And if someone has an answer, please raise your hand and uh, come in. Uh, thank you, Andre. Um, so we've only got a couple of minutes left. I want to pick up on one of the questions that Abdul Dube uh, left in the chat. So talking about how uh, alternative resources, alternative libraries, networks, community groups uh, are started by people that don't fit into the citizen category. So I think there's, uh, there's definitely a sense that there's loads of variety in community groups, those that are dedicated to learning, to information and to sharing things. And also there's loads of variety in the concept of citizen. It isn't just about like the passport that you have or the place where you pay your, your local taxes. Um, so I might uh, throw this one to Nicola or Olga. You know, what's the way in which the Europe Challenge is going to involve the communities around libraries, those people who have alternative things to offer, alternative visions, and how is it going to reach beyond the people who are just, you know, involved in everything all the time into those groups who, who may or may not be legal citizens, but who definitely feel they have an ownership and a belonging in their place? Thank you, Anthony, and thank you for the question. Um, well, that was, that was actually the starting point for us when we started to think about the Europe challenge before, before we even thought even in a way about libraries. And then we, we kind of came on board with the idea as, as, uh, as we've mentioned before, ECF had been looking at libraries and their function and their key function as a public space, especially in Europe, but also globally. And um, that was a key question. How are we gonna make sure that we're not just going to work with communities that are already involved with libraries? So we um, have made efforts and actually some of the examples that have been given, um, such as um, Ardus specifically trying to work with homeless communities who of course don't even have a documentation to register to belong to be a library, um, is an example of them also specifically addressing this community. So I think in a way, we started with that question. How do we, how do we make sure we're not just talking to the people we're already talking to? Um, and that's also why we're giving ourselves a year of this development process. So we're, today is an introduction to the Europe Challenge. Today is an introduction to, to the libraries who are working with their, their communities, who they've started new communities, they've started to find and started to talk to and find out from those people what they think is their local European challenge and how they can redesign something and make change. Um, and people who would not normally have that opportunity to do so. I don't know, Olga, if you wanted to add anything. No, I think that was exhaustive. Thanks, Nicola. Uh, so, just one last question that's come out of the come out of the chat. Uh, this is from uh, from Geert Lievens. Um, is decolonization a current challenge for public libraries in Europe? I think there's something that obviously very very live in lots of communities uh, i don't know if one of the one of the library uh, library colleagues would perhaps want to pick that up and share their experiences of how they decolonize libraries we've got about uh, two three minutes left so i'll need to ask you to keep it short but just the start of the conversation I think we have Rul who wants to respond to this question from Oba. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so we we started a project two years ago called the House of All Languages, in which we work together with uh, representatives of various cultural diverse communities uh, living in the city of Amsterdam, organized uh, representatives mostly. Um, and we started working together with uh, uh, various organizations, but one in particular that really represents um, the questions that come with decolonizing uh, the library. And we've had 
very good experiences so far. So, so the aim is to um, co-create new collections or put our existing collections in a new context or perspective. And we do both. Uh, we add exhibitions to it. We add cultural programs to it. And we find that uh, it's an excellent way to start a dialogue and a nar narrative by really looking at people who know the themes we're talking about here and know the challenges that comes to it and the nuances. So my advice would be to, uh, to, to look at partners, organizations, uh, or individuals that are really familiar with these, these topics and uh, have a dialogue and start working with them because it's, it's an excellent way to, uh, uh, to, to, to get in contact with both um, uh, uh, the, the existing library communities, but also new communities that you try to connect to the library or to, to everything we have to offer. And I think uh, Marta has just shared a link so you can uh, find out a bit more about the project. That's great. Thank you, Rule. Um, so we're at the end of our time today. Uh, thank you to those who ask questions. Uh, please do stay involved and uh, stay connected to the process. If you've been inspired by what you've heard and you want to get involved as the uh, as the programme develops, please drop the Cultural Foundation a line at ask uh, at culturalfoundation.eu. Uh, and also make sure you're taking advantage of the other Europe Day events uh, on the uh, europeday.eu uh, website. There's lots of great stuff going on, including the launch of the Conference on the Future of Europe, another opportunity to get citizen voices and, and different uh, perspectives into the European conversation. Um, Ashley is going to provide a, a link in the chat uh, to the Common Ground online publication, which you might want to have a look at to talk a little bit, to see a little bit more about of some of the background thinking behind this. Uh, but it just remains for me to say to, uh, to thank uh, Jan, to thank the European Cultural Foundation and the other partners uh, to, for their participation today, to thank their colleagues from libraries all around Europe who've shared their different perspectives and to reinforce the point that this is the start of something, not the end. You know, it is definitely a growing conversation and one that we would like people to get involved with. Uh, so please do contact us, uh, as I say, ask at culturefoundation.org. At EU, if you want to hear about uh, hear more about it, uh, stay in touch with the European Cultural Foundation and the partners to find out more. And we very much look forward to making this a growing and spreading conversation over the next little while. Thanks very much, everybody, and enjoy the rest of Europe Day. <laughs>